five, four, three, two, one. But who's counting, right? And his name is Major. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Major Garrett. From the nation's capital. Major, fantastic. It's the takeout. This is a major achievement. With CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent. Major Garrett. Yes, CBS. Yes, hi. Major Garrett. Major, that's nonsense. And you should know better. Is Major out of the doghouse? <laughs> the answer is yes. Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. Our guest this week, I'm going to get right to it, John Kirby, Chief Spokesperson for the Biden White House in terms of national security. John, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me, Major. Good to be with you. So we're going to do this in essentially two baskets. A lot of news of the day stuff. Sure. And then some larger strategic conversations with your permission. So let's do news of the day. Okay. Uh, we're recording this March 16th, so our audience will be hearing this throughout the weekend. So it may be overtaken by events. I always let you know when we're recording so you know if you're reading something later. This is a bit time stamped. But on this morning, the Pentagon has released video that it says, and I think the evidence is pretty clear, what happened with the Reaper drone. What's your take on that video, and what's your reaction to the Russians continuing to say otherwise? There are three things when you look at that video that are clear and unmistakable, Major. One, uh, that this was a, a deliberate, aggressive, overly aggressive move by this pilot. Number two, that they were attempting to dump fuel on that MQ-9, because you can see it you know, pouring out of the back of that jet. Uh, and three that they did in fact strike the MQ-9. Because as you saw in the aftermath of the, of, the, of, the, of the hit, the collision video, you can see clearly that one of propeller blades is completely bent and unusable. Mm -hmm. And it was because of that, because it was not, uh, we weren't able to continue to fly the drone that we had to go ahead and down it. So three things were unmistakable. What's not clear in the video is whether the pilot intended to strike the drone uh, or just it was poor flying. Um, either way, doesn't matter. Completely inappropriate, unsafe, and unprofessional. Is it an act of war? I, I don't think I would call it an act of war, no. I mean, it, it, it was unsafe, it was unprofessional. Um, but look, nobody, nobody wants to see this war escalate uh, between the United States and Russia, to make it become a war between the United States and Russia. You said earlier this week that this will not deter surveillance flights of this kind. That is correct? right. That, that's right. They will, they, they will continue. The Secretary of Defense said that himself yesterday in a press conference. Will they be enlarged? Will there be more of them? I won't get into the actual um, operational routes that the Pentagon or will the, be Or the uh, tempo, as you I, say. I won't. Yeah, that, that would be not wise for me to do on any occasion, certainly in, in the wake of this. Uh, so I, I, won't, I wouldn't do that. But what I can assure you is that... Uh, these flights are important for our national security interests, uh, for the, the support that we're giving Ukraine. And as the Secretary of Defense said yesterday, they're going to continue. And, and just to make, put a fine point on this, we're talking about international airspace over international waters. We have every right to be there, and we're going to continue to do that. Russia calls that a restricted flight zone. It's not. It's international airspace, pure and simple. On our air again, March 16th this morning... Marco Rubio, senator from Florida, said the Pentagon ought to think about military escort flights for these Reaper drone surveillance flights. Agree or disagree? I'll let the Pentagon obviously speak to that. There are, of course, uh, much increased risks if you do that. Um, remember, Spell them out for my audience, Well, please. for instance, uh, uh, we, we, you certainly would be putting pilots at greater risk if the Russians are going to continue to fly in this aggressive manner. Um, we, do, we do not have uh, assets in and around the Black Sea for search and rescue, for instance, if a pilot were to be, be shot down or, or to have to eject. Um, this is the same set of debates that we had early in the war about a no-fly zone. Mm -hmm. Everybody was saying, well, you need to do a new-fly zone. Right. You do that, you're basically in the war. Uh, and we have been working very, very hard uh, to not escalate this, not to seek conflict with Russia. You put pilots up there escorting drones. First of all, there's a little bit of redundancy there. Um, why would you need both an unmanned and a manned uh, mm -hmm. uh, aircraft to, to do ISR? Um, and number two, there's a greater risk to, uh, uh, to our pilots and to the, the broader potential for escalation. Right. 
My audience oftentimes hears acronyms. I like to pause and explain what those mean. ISR, what does that mean? Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. I apologize for no, that. No, that's okay. Yeah. That's uh, okay. I should, I should have been better about that. That's okay. And that's, what, that's what's happening with these drones. They are gathering intel, which we correct. use, and then we also hand off what is most useful to the Ukrainians. That is right. Okay. They are not flying combat missions. Even though they are capable of, of uh, being armed, they are not. Will it be recovered? By the United States? I think the Pentagon's still working their way through that. Um, I don't know that it will be. Um, there are reports this morning, again, March 16th, that there are two Russian vessels nearby. Could be. I can't confirm those reports. The, uh, the Russians did say publicly that they were going to try to recover. What will they find? They won't find anything of any intrinsic value. I can assure you of that. We uh, took steps to mitigate any intelligence collection can capability. Can you be more specific? No. But we took steps. Did we blow it up? We took steps to mitigate any uh, any content that would be on that I believe the that defense thing. secretary said yesterday, the 15th, that, or Mark Milley might have, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that software had been wiped and things like that. That would be one of the mitigating measures. It, it, that is a way you can do that. Um, I'll leave it. At, I'll leave it at that. But but to your first question, yes. uh, Major, the whatever would be left on the surface would likely be flight control surfaces, pieces of wings, or the fuselage doubtful that's going to be of any value to anybody in terms of intelligence uh, or uh, or the capability on the MQ-9 we are not concerned that they're going to get anything of value and just to remind the, the water there in the Black Sea right there is four to five thousand feet deep so anything of value in other words the hardware on the drone will have sunk and I find it very unlikely that they're going to be able to recover anything like that very good again uh, March 16th is the recording date but on this morning Poland has announced that it will provide in the near term four MiG-29 jets and may provide as many as six additional MiG-29 jets. Your response? It's a sovereign decision. And one of the things that's really important here, uh, Major, and I'm glad that you asked that question, is the whole, the, the whole issue at stake here in Ukraine is the idea of sovereignty, Ukraine's sovereignty, their independence, their right to exist as a nation. And the way we've approached providing support to Ukraine internationally is to respect the sovereign decisions of all the nations that are willing or unwilling to support Ukraine. So I've seen this announcement, uh, certainly. Um, uh, it's not a surprise. No, uh, it's not a surprise. Poland has talked about this in the mm -hmm. past. Um, obviously, it's up to them to decide how and when and, and uh, you know, in, under what circumstances they'll, they'll provide the jets. I don't want to speak for the Polish government, but I will say the Poles have been incredibly supportive of efforts to support Ukraine. They are hosting a million and a half Polish refugees. Many months ago, we had the Polish ambassador on this program, and he talked about that. Yeah, I'm sorry, a million and a half Ukrainian refugees mm -hmm. in Poland. And th those refugees have almost every right of a Polish citizen. They're living in homes, not in camps. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can go to school. They can get jobs. They're even qualifying for health care. The Poles have just been remarkable. Does the uh, idea of MiG-29s, from your vantage point, change Anything strategically or operationally on the ground in this war? The, the additional um, air capabilities that those MiGs could provide the Ukrainian Air Force, I, I think you can't undercount that. You can't un I mean, that, that's going to be helpful to them. Um, but it really depends on how many are provided and on what timeline to, to, to be able to determine the strategic impact. So let's take these two topics and put them together. The drone, what we've learned about it, the intentionality of it, the Polish decision on MiG-29s, how do those two, if at all, affect the U.S. decision on F-16s? There won't be an impact of this decision on any pending decision for us on F-16s. You've heard the president talk They're about this. They're disconnected. That's correct. You've heard the president talk about this. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not considering F-16s for now. Um, we don't believe that that's uh, uh, a decision that we need to make right now or that we even should make right now. What we are making decisions on are the kinds of capabilities that the Ukrainians need in the weeks and months ahead. And we're kind of classifying them as the four A's. Artillery, ammunition, air defense, and armored capabilities, tanks, armored vehicles. Because when you look in the weeks uh, ahead, um, the kind of fighting that, that the Ukrainians say they believe they're going to be in is fighting in open terrain. Um, and what they need are what, what the Pentagon calls combined arms warfare uh, ability, combined arms maneuver. And so we're taking a battalion or two out of Ukraine uh, almost every month, and we're giving them training on how to do that. That is the voice of John Kirby, a significant presence in the White House briefing room. 
for good reason. We have a lot of questions for him. We'll be back for more segment two of The Takeout coming your way in just a minute. There are national security concerns with respect to TikTok and the potential for data mining. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. Uh, and our thanks to the Willard Hotel Cafe du Parc. We're having breakfast with John Kirby. It's a good way to start a morning. Uh, John, let's talk a little bit again in the uh, news of the day heading. Yeah. Uh, there are reports confirmed by the company, meaning TikTok, that there has been a request from the U.S. government that it divest itself from ByteDance, its Chinese parent company. Can you offer any uh, insight on that? No, I actually can't. Um, Why not? Uh, th- this is uh, it's just an issue that uh, uh, we're just not able to talk about right now. Because? There are the, the there negotiations are, continue. There are there's a process, uh, as you know, a um, committee on foreign an, investment an inve- in the United States. Committee on foreign investment the in the United States. The acronym you might C- hear is CFIUS. Yes. And uh, because of that, uh, there's a real limit to what I can say on this. Can you describe the concerns broadly of the administration about national security and TikTok? More than a hundred million Americans use the platform. President has spoken to this. Yes. Uh, we are uh, there are national security concerns with respect to TikTok and the potential for data mining um, and um, or I, using I, the ident- platform yeah, for, plat- for ident- propaganda purposes. Uh, well, that too, but but it's really more on the technical side. Okay, and uh, you know potential for. Uh, um, uh, identifying information and, and data to be uh, to be mined in an inappropriate way, and that's really what's driving the national security implications. And as you know, mm-hmm. President Biden has banned the use of Tic Tac on government devices, right. uh, including the military. Our recruiters aren't able to use it to, to recruit. So, um, uh, I mean, it, there are th- those those are still significant concerns that we have. What would you say, if you could, is the goal of these conversations? Well, again, I I got to be really careful here and not, and not get into this. Um, I would just take ten steps back and say we we have national security concerns over TikTok and the way that app, um, the the way the people that run that app conduct themselves and the capabilities inside that app, uh, and I really do need to leave it there. Understood. There is legislation that has passed the House of Representatives by a vote of 419 to zero. It passed the United States Senate by unanimous consent, meaning not a single dissenting voice, requiring or seeking of the administration to declassify through the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, all documents related to the origins of COVID. Does the president intend to sign that? I'll leave that to the president to to decide and to determine. I'm not going to get ahead of his decision space. That said, again, put this into some perspective, shortly after the president came into office, he did declassify and make public uh, the the work of the, the director of national intelligence with respect to COVID origins. And as you know, it was non-conclusive, that work. Um, then he ordered the intelligence community to continue to stay at the work uh, and, and even brought in the Department of Energy, which runs the national labs. Which has, with a degree of low confidence, which is a term of art, said it believes it came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. That's a, that's, that reporting is based on a classified report, so I'm not going to talk about that. I would you just can't continue. confirm or deny that. I cannot. But what I can tell you, though, is that it's still non-conclusive. Uh, there is no consensus among the intelligence community, including now the uh, Department of Energy uh, and the FBI that are working on this for the president. Uh, there's no consensus about what the origins were. But, and again, let's not lose the forest for the trees here. It's important to do this work. The president's committed to doing this work, and he will absolutely want to share what we can with the American people as soon as we can, and, and as well as with Congress. He believes in that transparency, and he proved that on day one. But he believes that in order to prevent the next pandemic, we've got to have a good understanding of what caused this one. Uh, and he also believes that the scientific research Uh, into novel coronaviruses is important so that we can prevent the next one. So he wants that scientific research to continue, but he is insistent that it needs to continue again in a uh, completely transparent and authentic manner. Talked about uh, classification, transparency. I know you're not going to talk, and I don't want you to talk, about the president and classified documents. What I'm curious about, and I think this is an operational question of import, has anything changed in terms of procedures within the White House itself 
since the disclosure that documents marked classified showed up where they ought not to have been? No. In short, no. Okay, the uh, same procedures. Same procedures, and they're, they're time-tested, well-worn, um, and understood by everybody that works at the National Security Council and at the White House, uh, how you treat classified documents. And uh, so, no, there's been no, no, no review, no, no change in procedures. Those procedures exist for a reason, and they're, they're not just procedures that we use at the White House. They're procedures right. that you use across the government. And for someone in my audience, you might say, well, it, okay, uh, they're well-established, well-understood, uh, former President Trump, former Vice President Pence, and former Vice President Biden all got tripped up by it. Might there not be a need to review that, you would say? The, these are really uh, uh, a comprehensive set of procedures and, and policies and protocols with respect to how you, you, you treat classified information. Um, and again, they're, they're well understood by everybody. As a matter of fact, you routinely have to go through um, uh, regular training on this, updated training, revised training all the time on this. I, I myself have to do that. So um, no, there's no need to revisit the actual uh, procedures. Do we overclassify in this country? I think uh, um, we do the best we can, Major, to... I mean, you know my perspective on that as a reporter. Uh, I'm sure you think we... I'm sure you we, think that we do. I do, I, I do and, flat out. I think, look, it's a balance. You, 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 My you, sense is the default is to class, just to classify. No, I wouldn't say that it's that glib that uh, that something comes in and we just say, oh, well, let's classify that so we don't have to give it to major, right? It, it's not that. It, it's it's not it's not like that. Um, it, th th there's a balance you try to strike with information, sensitive information, um, whether it needs to be classified, yes or no. If so, at what level? You know, because there's different grades of, of level of classification, and then when. Should it be declassified, and in what way should it be de declassified? So I, I would, I would say that there's no easy answer to your question. You know, mm -hmm. is it is it overclassified or not? It, it really does depend on the situation. I, I'll tell you, you didn't ask about this, but one of the things that we've done really, really well in the last year of the war in Ukraine is is downgrade intelligence and make it public, and that is a lesson I hope we don't forget. Um, we have, uh, heck, I just did it the other day. At the it can be a tool in information, quote-unquote, warfare. Absolutely. I just did it uh, the other day uh, in my gaggle this week, uh, mm -hmm. earlier this week, when uh, we downgraded some intelligence about Moldova and Russia's attempts to disrupt the dem dem democratic process and institutions in Moldova. Uh, that took... Uh, week and a half, two weeks of working with the intelligence community to get that script downgraded, and I was uh, able to deliver it at one of my um, mm -hmm. off-camera gaggles. Th this is a, uh, it is a tool, and it's not, and I, you know, you described it as, I think, information warfare, warfare. or something. I, I, I think I might describe it a little differently than I that. You I, I don't, I don't think uh, we, we look at it as some sort of weapon. Uh, we look at it as a, a responsible use of information to inform the public about what's going on, but also, but also mm -hmm. to let certain adversaries mm -hmm. know that we know what they're up to right. and hopefully, you know, affect their calculus as well. Part of that falls uh, into what we have deduced about Chinese intentions with lethal aid in the battle space of Ukraine. What do we know? We know that they haven't taken it off the table. Uh, we also don't believe that they have made a decision to, to actually move forward on it. And we obviously don't want them to do that. We don't believe that it's in China's best interest to be on that side of the war in, in that way, to help Mr. Putin slaughter innocent Ukrainians. Uh, we don't believe it's in China's best interest, but obviously that they'll have, a, they'll have a choice to make. On this program, I have interviewed the parents of Austin Tice. I've also, in various other capacities, interviewed uh, the relatives of Paul Whelan. What can you tell me about those two cases? Two very, very different cases. Very so different, no first question. Of all, first of all, uh, uh, to the families, both families, um, I, 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 I want them to know on behalf of President Biden how focused we are on their loved ones um, and doing everything we can to learn more um, and, to, uh, and to see their, their cases resolved. Um, they are, but they are two very different cases no indeed. Doubt. Um, and, and I can assure you, as a matter of fact, just on my way over here uh, to see you, I had a, a, a chat uh, with an individual at the National Security Council that uh, plays a major role in our discussions and efforts to get uh, wrongfully detained Americans home. Um, and uh, we were talking about uh, a, a different 
a different case, mm-hmm. but I can assure you that it is something that is foremost on everyone's mind. The voice of John Kirby. The takeout returns for segment three in just one second. My goodness, of all the founding ideals, the one that you have to believe that all Americans understand is the idea of independence. And we didn't win our independence without help from abroad. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. John Kirby is our guest. Uh, Earlier this week, John, the uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said, the U.S., back to Ukraine, providing capabilities to, quote, change the dynamics of the battlefield. What does that mean? That means And what do we anticipate happening in the next few months? So what the Secretary is referring to is the evolving nature of this conflict. And we have tried since the beginning to evolve with it. So for instance, in the first few days when everybody was worried about the fall of Kyiv, mm-hmm. the capabilities that the Ukrainians needed the most were the Javelin anti-tank missiles and Stingers, uh, you know, air, air shoulder launched air defense. Um, and so that's what we focused on. And then as the war uh, went on into the spring and Mr. Putin left Kyiv and left Kharkiv and started focusing on the Donbass, which is a lot like Kansas, it became artillery. And we were all talking about artillery. I became much more informed about artillery than I ever was as a former naval officer. Uh, and then the HIMARS, right? These advanced, the, these uh, uh, artillery rocket systems. Um, so uh, we focused on that. Um, then in the fall, Mr. Putin decided he was going to bomb and strike civilian infrastructure using Iranian drones and cruise missiles. So medium range air defense become became much more important and so we started providing those and including a future patriot battery going into ukraine um and now to your question um as the weather starts to improve we expect that the russians are going to go on the offense we also have every expectations that the ukrainians are going to want to go on the offense and that's why we are focusing so much uh, on artillery ammunition armored capabilities and air defense to help them in this combined arms warfare that we know they're going to be in for uh, the next weeks and months ahead and i think you're going to see very soon from the administration excuse me yet another package of uh, security assistance and you'll see in that package the kinds of capabilities that very much match what i just I just uh, detail for Nine you. countries are due to deliver more than 150 Leopard tanks to Ukraine. Yeah. Will they arrive soon enough? We think that uh, it's obviously going to be up to these countries, but we think that uh, they should be able to get uh, on the ground at least a good portion of that number on the ground you know, in months ahead. I, I couldn't give you an exact mm-hmm. schedule, uh, but one of the important things about um, – the decision by the Germans to allow Leopard tanks to go in. One of the, what, what, what made that so critical is not only the fact that the Leopard's a good tank, um, and it won't, won't be that difficult for the Ukrainians to learn how to use that tank, is that there's many of them on the continent and more available than, say, American Abrams. American Abrams. So we do expect that in weeks and months ahead, more Leopards will show up. But I couldn't tell you exactly how many on what timeline, because, again, that's a sovereign decision by each of these nations that have these tanks. I know you are prohibited from talking about office holders or in a political context, so I'm going to take that off the table for I you. I appreciate that. But in general, there is a conversation going on, and you can see it play out in Republican circles all over the place, about whether or not to continue supporting Ukraine. And there's polling data that shows at least half of Republicans, or self-identify, are opposed to future funding or additional funding beyond what has already been committed. Talk to them. So what's, your, what's your argument? And what's the president's argument? I think if you look at the, the president's speech in Warsaw a couple of weeks ago, he laid his argument out really, really well. And if folks haven't taken a look at, at, at that speech, I highly encourage them, particularly if you're a skeptic, to read his remarks in, in Warsaw, uh, where he laid the case, I think, very convincingly for why this war matters beyond just Ukraine. And I say that not to minimize the effect on Ukraine because it's devastating what Mr. Putin has done to the Ukrainian people uh, and the Ukrainian country. Um, it, that alone, just the, just the death, the, destru- the destruction, the 
the atrocities, the rape and the murder, the, 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 the deportation of thousands of Ukrainian children into Russian camps, uh, filtration camps, is devastating enough, but... War crimes across the horizon. Uh, uh, yes, but um, aside from all that, uh, what's at stake here is the idea, as I said earlier, of sovereignty, of independence. And my goodness, of all the founding ideals, the one that you have to believe that all Americans understand is the idea of independence. And we didn't win our independence without help from abroad. Mm -hmm. And no matter how you vote in this country, um, I think we can all get behind this idea of independence. The, the other thing I'd say, Major, is that, and I've heard the the it's argument. not vital. It may be an interest, but it's not vital. I've heard that argument. I've also heard the, the cost thing. If we just lay back and we let Putin take Ukraine, because mind you, that's what he still wants. He hasn't backed off those larger strategic goals. He's if not just, looking for an off-ramp. If we just let him take all of Ukraine, what's next? And, and don't believe for a second that if there is a, a next thing for Putin, that the costs uh, to Americans in blood and in treasure, uh, will be exorbitantly higher than what we have spent on supporting Ukraine to date. And the other thing I'd say is, judge the Ukrainians by what they're doing with what we're giving them. This, this is not a country, these are not a people that are ungrateful or incompetent with the way they're using the support they're getting. I mean, my goodness, there are, t there are some times where we, we can get things from the time the president signs it to it's in the hands of a Ukrainian soldier within a matter of days when it's come to ammunition, small arms, and that kind of thing. Now, obviously, some systems take a little bit longer, but, but just take a look at what they've done. Who could have predicted, you know, when, when, when they were marching on Kyiv, when the Russians were, had a column of tanks and armored vehicles streaming down towards Kyiv, and everybody was saying it was going to fall in three days, Zelensky was going to have to evacuate, and here we are a year later, and they, the Ukrainians have taken back more than 50% of the territory that the Russians initially captured in the early weeks and months of the war. And they're still going, Major. They're still at it. Uh, and they do have plans to continue to stay at this in the weeks and months ahead. And it's really important that we stay with them because there is an awful lot more at stake here. Who blew up Nord Stream 2? I don't know. And Does we the U.S. government care? We, we don't know who did it. There are three investigations going mm -hmm. on by three of our European partners. That work is still ongoing, and uh, we're not going to get ahead of, uh, of what they find. Of course, we'd like to know as, as best we can, but um, these are three independent investigations by uh, uh, three terrific partners, and like I said, we're not going to get ahead of that. Do you have any comment on Seymour Hersh's reporting that the U.S. did it? False. Totally. And I, uh, I, I say that with no... Uh, 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 you know, I'm not. I'm not happy to say that. Um, uh, I know Mr. Hirsch and uh, his terrific reporting. You know, from the, the Vietnam past. War. Mm -hmm. But this uh, report of his is 100% false. I can assure you that the United States government had no role whatsoever uh, in what happened to the Nord Stream 2. We do believe it was an act of sabotage, but I can uh, absolutely, positively assure you that the United States had no role in it. There is some reporting that there is an intelligence thread that the Ukrainians did it. Again, there's three investigations going on, and I'm just not going to get ahead of, of, of where they are. So let's talk about China and Taiwan. Um, like a lot of people in Washington, I read The uh, Economist avidly. It has an entire section this week on the potential of war between the United States and China over Taiwan. An entire section. And then it raises a couple of questions. It says the United States and China right now is engaged in a zero-sum game of life and death over the future of China, and the United States needs to weigh carefully how its actions, in the words of the economists, could provoke the very war the United States is trying to prevent. I would say that you take a look at how President Biden is trying to manage this most consequential of bilateral relationships. And he really believes that it is. And he makes it very clear and made it clear to President Xi just a few months ago in Bali at the G20 that we seek competition with China, not conflict. And there is no reason, and the president has said this himself, there's no reason for the tensions with China to boil over into conflict. Certainly not over the tensions of the Strait 
uh, in, in between uh, the mainland and, and Taiwan. We have not changed our policy with respect to One China. We do not support independence for Taiwan, mm -hmm. but we are obligated and we will continue to support sufficient self-defense capabilities for Taiwan through the Taiwan Relations Act. Nothing has changed, and so there should be no reason for conflict. And, you know, we're, that's the way we're approaching this, and quite frankly, that's the way we're approaching the, the larger relationship with China. We don't seek a conflict. We do seek competition, and the president would be the first one to tell you, if he was sitting here, that he believes the United States can win in that competition. Maybe someday he will sit here. That would be a good idea. John Kirby, uh, segment four of The Takeout, coming your way in just a second. There's no reason for this to, to boil into conflict. There's absolutely no change in our policy. Uh, and so there should be no reason for President Xi to want to explore military options. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. John Kirby is our special guest. Again, our thanks to Cafe de Park and the Willard Hotel for breakfast. Uh, more on China and Taiwan. Um, it is said, John, that the U.S. the balance between the United States and China no longer favors the U.S. True? I would say that we have invested an awful lot into the Indo-Pacific region, um, not just in terms of additional military capabilities. You were part of the Obama administration when the so-called pivot began. And we, we, we moved to produce about 60% of the United States Navy's presence. So 60% of the United States Navy in the Pacific uh, under the Obama administration. And there was a lot more energy put in there. And it wasn't just military either. There was a lot more political, economic, and even diplomatic capital put into the Indo-Pacific. And I would tell you that President Biden continues uh, to, to want to make sure he strengthens uh, our vast network of alliances and partnerships uh, in that region. Take a look at what just happened on Monday. The president was out in San Diego mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. prime minister. My hometown. San Diego, great mm -hmm. town, great Navy town. Great Navy town. Um, but he was out there with mm -hmm. uh, uh, his counterparts from Australia and from the UK announcing the next steps in this AUKUS arrangement. Now, let me caveat this by making it very clear that the AUKUS arrangement, this ability which stands for Australia, Australia UK, a and US, US. thank you, um, <laughs> it's a trilateral agreement to uh, eventually uh, produce and provide Australia the capability of producing for themselves nuclear-powered submarines. It is not aimed at China. It is not aimed at one country. But what it is aimed at, and this really gets to your question, is strengthening our vast network of alliances and partnerships in the Pacific. And in this case, bringing in a transatlantic ally, the UK, into the Indo-Pacific in a more meaningful way than they've already even been. China has nothing like this network of friends that we have. Most Americans don't realize five of our seven treaty alliances are in the Indo-Pacific region. Mm -hmm. Five of seven. So we have invested and will continue to invest a lot in that. I would say, again, we're looking at China from competition, not from a conflict perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but I would say the United States is poised well, very, very well. To, to succeed in that competition. There are reports that the CIA believes that Xi Jinping told his military to be ready to invade Taiwan by 2027. Is that true? The military uh, has already spoken to this publicly, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that, um, that that is President Xi's uh, direction to his military. We and believe need, it? Need to stress, uh, we have no reason not to believe that, okay. uh, need to stress that it is, it is to be capable by 2027, not to execute by 2027. Important distinction. Very important distinction. And again, I want to go back to what I said earlier. There's no reason for this to, to boil into conflict. There's absolutely no change in our policy. Uh, and so there should be no reason for President Xi to want to explore military options. We do not support a change in the status quo unilaterally made. And we certainly don't support a change to the status quo unilaterally made by force. When the Chinese balloon situation was going on, uh, there was an attempt to contact Chinese defense officials. They didn't pick up. As I read yesterday, uh, the defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, talked to his Russian counterpart for the first time in five months. Yeah. That doesn't sound healthy to me. We would agree that with you that uh, lines of communication are really important and with both countries, with both Russia and China. Now, 
we we have existing lines of communication. The question is, uh, can they be better? In China's case, right now, there's not any military to military communications. One of the things that the Chinese kind of cut off when Speaker Pelosi then went, mm-hmm. went then Speaker Pelosi went to Taiwan was a military to military vehicle for communication, and we want to get that back on. But we do have the ability to communicate directly with senior Chinese leaders, particularly through our embassy in, mm-hmm. in Beijing. Of course. Um, and there's nothing preventing the president from speaking to President Xi. In fact, he said recently that he wants to to have another communication with, with President Xi. That's not on the schedule right now. We'll see where that goes. In Russia, or with Russia, uh, there's no senior leader communications right now. Uh, given the brutality and the atrocities that Mr. Putin is visiting upon the Ukrainian people, I think you can understand that. That said... There are military to military lines of communication, a deconfliction line that we use, particularly along NATO's eastern flank. And of course, we have an ambassador uh, in, in Moscow uh, as well. So um, th- there are ways to, 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 to pass on messages. But the point is, they, they can and they, and they should be improved. And so we're, we're, we're working on that. Does the White House support or not support a trip to Taiwan by the current Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy? That's going to be up to the Speaker of the House. Uh, uh, as we said when Speaker Pelosi went, uh, it's the Speaker's choice. We do not tell members of Congress where or when they can travel. Uh, that is their decision to make. If a uh, member of Congress decides to go, uh, then we will do everything we can to inform them, provide them the kind of context and information they need to to have a safe and productive trip, but we are not getting involved in those decisions. The House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee has requested three specific documents from the State Department about Afghanistan. A uh, cable, a dissent cable, and reaction. The uh, Ambassador Dan Smith's after action report and the U.S. Embassy Kabul's emergency action plans. It has asked and asked and asked for this. The uh, chairman of that committee, Mike McCall, has threatened to subpoena that. Republicans believe there is something in those documents that is relevant to the evacuation of Afghanistan and some mistakes made therein. Will the administration commit to providing those documents? I will refer to the State Department on specific State Department documents and calls by Congress for them. That's, uh, that's really their place to, to speak to. But broadly speaking, get, you know, pulling it back a little bit, um, uh, we absolutely will uh, continue. And, and I say continue quite literally because it's not like we haven't had opportunities to talk to members of Congress in classified and unclassified sessions mm-hmm. uh, about Afghanistan and the withdrawal, and we'll continue to do that. Were mistakes made? I think without question. I mean, um, uh, clearly those first few days were uh, were tragic for everybody to see. I was at the Pentagon. Mm-hmm. I remember it. Um, and You actually put together a briefing in which the original story about the U.S. response, military kinetic response, to the bombing was misguided. That's right. We so to put it mildly. In the, yes, in the first few days, I mean, I think nobody was nobody was comforted by uh, the scenes of, of uh, you know Afghan storming aircraft and and, and falling off them. It was tragic. Um, and uh, on the 26th of August, we lost 13 members of our military, mostly Marines, at the Abbey Gate when a suicide bomber. Uh, exploded himself in his vest and, and, and took those 13 as well as dozens of innocent Afghans uh, uh, with him. Um, and then on the 29th of August, as you rightly noted, uh, the, the Pentagon, in, the effort, in an effort to act on intelligence we believed was accurate, um, uh, dropped a, a, a bomb on uh, an innocent man and killed him and, and some of his children. Um, and we're deeply regretful for that. And uh, we investigated fully investigated the explosion at Abbey Gate, fully investigated the 29 August airstrike, um, and we've already learned from those from those events. Uh, and so, uh, of course, look, back to your original question. I, I, I was in the military a long, long time. I, I can't think of a single military operation, simple or complex, that uh, that was ever executed perfectly. It's, in, it's impossible to find one. There's always going to be uh, things that uh, that you didn't plan for. There's always going to be things you do that you um, that you maybe could have done better, uh, or ma- mistakes that you made. And the important thing is that you you learn from them, 
And we did. We, we investigated those two incidents, and we've learned from them. As a matter of fact, with respect to the errant airstrike, uh, as a result of that, the Pentagon has stood up an entire process uh, to reduce civilian harm and to learn from the mistakes, not only from the 29th of August, uh, Major, but from other uh, airstrikes that were conducted in recent years, to learn from those mistakes to try to make sure that we do better at, uh, at mitigating civilian harm. The voice of John Kirby. John, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for being here. Good Stay tuned for your takeout outtake especial coming your way next. For music, it's, it's not, no question about it. It's, it's Alan Jackson. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a big country music fan. I have been since I was just a little guy. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome to your Takeout Outtake Especial. I am, of course, Major Garrett. John Kirby is our special guest. Uh, thanks to the Willard Hotel Cafe de Park for having breakfast. Again, March 16th. Uh, we didn't get to the Middle East. We're not going to spend a lot of time there. But before we get to the fun and games part of this, I do want to run by you some headlines. I'm sure you noted uh, in the recent New York Times. U.S. sidelined in Mideast Pact led by Beijing. Power shift in region. And the story went on to say that uh, Beijing brokering an arrangement between Saudi Arabia and Iran heralds more influence by China in the region and a commensurate loss of influence in the region for the United States. The president is very... True or not true? The president's very confident and comfortable with uh, American leadership uh, in the region and the importance that we place on the region. I mean, he was, went to mm -hmm. the region in the summertime, uh, uh, to Saudi Arabia, uh, to meet with the uh, members of the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, um, as well as uh, to a visit to Israel. Um, he has prioritized that region and will continue to do that. Um, but China playing there is a new thing, and the assessment of many analysts quoted by the New York Times is, New York Times was, that it reflects more influence by China, less by the United States. True or not true? We would not agree with that there's uh, more influence uh, by, by China over the United States. Um, I understand the headlines. I get that. Um, it's not new for the Chinese to try to um, uh, expand their influence uh, in the Middle East or in Africa or in Latin America for that, uh, uh, for that w w manner. But um, we continue to be very confident and comfortable in the relationships that we have and the way we're deepening those relationships uh, and fostering a, a better stability and security in the region. And back to this particular arrangement, if it works, that's a good thing. If it can help end the war in Yemen, mm -hmm. a, a war, by the way, that's on its 10th month of a truce that the United States, States helped initiated broker, and broker. No question about um, it. That is the if, backdrop. If it helps end that, terrific. If it can help eliminate the threats from the Houthi rebels' uh, missile threats into Saudi Arabia, where, by the way, we have 70,000 Americans living and working, that's a good thing. So we would hope that it succeeds. Um, but we're not, uh, that we're not, we take, take no umbrage about that. But, and I don't, it just, I think we need to be, you know, we need to have a sense of perspective here. The Iranians are not exactly known for keeping their word. And we hope that they do. But we have to watch this and, and watch it closely. This is the funny games part of the program, so we do have uh, some lighter questions, uh, which I hope you'll enjoy. Most of our guests do. In whatever, whatever order you prefer to take these questions, most influential book in your life and why, favorite movie, and if you're on a long flight or a long drive and you're really going to enjoy your favorite music, what artist or genre is that most likely to be? <laughs> well, those are actually not too hard. For music, it's, it's not, no question about it. It's, it's Alan Jackson. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a big country music fan. I have been since I was just a little guy. And, and um, I've ha I have literally every track that Alan Jackson has ever recorded. And uh, I just think he's just fantastic. And have you seen him? I only saw him once. Um, um, not long after September 11th, he wrote a really motivating song, beautiful song, uh, Where Were You When the World Stopped Turning, um, at, to, to reflect about 9-11. Um, I'm getting chills just talking about that song. And a few years after, on the anniversary of the attack, he came uh, to the Pentagon Courtyard to sing that song. It was for Good Morning America. And I had a chance to... I've heard of that show vaguely. Yeah, I had to... Yeah, I bet you have. 
I had a, so I had a chance to go into the courtyard and just hear him live. It was the only time I've ever seen him live. But it was nice because, first of all, it was a beautiful song, beautiful moment. Uh, but in that courtyard, which is small, you can kind of get up close to him. And um, I'd love to meet him someday. I've never met him. But uh, my goodness, I just, I just think he's, uh, he's just terrific. He sings really basic human songs uh, that, um, that I think anybody can relate to, whether you like country music or not, whether you grew up in the South or not. Um, uh, on the... Uh, on the book, it's that's an easy one too. It's Mark Twain's Following the Equator. Back in the late 1800s, he uh, was he needed a little cash, and so he and his editor arranged for him to go on a round the world uh, uh, tour, mostly by ship, but also by rail. Um, and he wrote this terrific memoir, Following the Equator. I don't know if you've read it or not, but um, when you I, I have re I've read that book now several times. It's the only book. Uh, that I have read more than once, Fantastic. and um, and I never I, I learn something every time, not just about the world around us, but about human behavior and what it means to be a citizen of the of the world. Mm -hmm. And plus, he's just funny. I mean, he's yes. just a great. He's. I've read humorous. Innocence Abroad, but not that. I will get Innocence to you Abroad is very very similar, mm -hmm. uh, but you'll like if you like that, you'll like, like following in the equator in the front piece of the book. There's a photo of him which I actually have printed out at home. Um, um, he's leaning back uh, with his foot on the railing of the ship, and then in his handwriting, it, it's my favorite quotation of all time, he just wrote, be good and you will be lonesome. And I think that's just a great, well, it's a great way of describing sort of uh, his irreverence and him, his ability not to take himself so, so seriously. So that's my favorite book. Um, and on the long, well, we talked movie. about the long ride. Oh, the movie. Um, boy, that's a tough one. That's a hard one. If, if I had only one movie that I would take with me to watch over and over again, I think it would be The Cane Mutiny. Mm. Also one of my favorite books. Which version? The, well, the, the, the original one with okay. Hunter Bogart. Right. Um, I think it would be that. I think it would be. There's the a very movie. bad version with Marlon Brando. There's a great line in that movie, which mm -hmm. is derived from the book, which mm -hmm. is a great book too, by the way, um, that I've always loved, um, where the, the the two new officers get on board and they're and they're looking at the the ship and they're learning it. The captain wanted them to get a tour, and their tour guide, who's a, a, a rather salty, seasoned lieutenant JG, says that the Navy was designed by geniuses to be run by idiots. And I just have always loved that line. Uh, so I that would that would probably be my favorite movie. Yeah. John Kirby, thanks for the time. My pleasure. Thank you. We'll see you next week, folks.